Welcome, everybody. I think most of you know me for any newcomers. My name is Ann Robichaud. I've lived in Umbria since 1975, moved here with my Italian husband from Palermo, Sicily, Pino. Some of you who've been following my talks from the beginning also shared in a talk on Sicily and the Palermo street food. And Pino and I worked the land for three years. He's a builder. I started an English language school, which I ran for some years and became an authorized guide to the region of Umbria. I am not an authorized guide to the region of Latium, but I am taking you today into the wonderful lakeside town of Bolsena, which is not far from Orvieto. And it is on a lake, which was a volcano probably about 300,000 years ago. I wish my geologist son Keegan were here with us this evening because he could give you a lot more information about the geology of the Lake Bolsena area. And here we have a lovely photo of Lake Bolsena, uh, the town of Bolsena in the foreground. Off in the distance, you can see one of the two islands of the lake, that is Isola Byzantina, at one time, it was an island inhabited by uh, papal families when this area was part of the papal states. Uh, some of you may be familiar and remember the name Paul III, the Farnese Pope, who built the Roca of Perugia, taxed salt, hence uh, creating an uprising in the mid 16th century. He used to summer in his villa on Isola Byzantina. But let us return now to Bolsena. We're going to start our talk uh, speaking about the Rocco Monaldeschi della Cervara. This is a fortress. Uh, its origins date from the 11th century, it was probably started in the 11th century, work went on for about three centuries until the 14th, 15th century. The reason for the building of the Rocca, it's thought, was um, the idea of a perhaps necessary defense in case Frederick Barbarossa and ancestors descended into this area. They wanted a, a defensive structure. The fortress then becomes a terrain or property, if you will, of the Monaldeschi family. Those of you who heard my Orvieto lecture will remember the Monaldeschis because their palace today houses the extraordinary Etruscan Museum of Orvieto. The Monaldeschis were Guelph. They were sympathetic to papal authority. Their enemies were the Ghibellines, the Filippeschi family. So there was constant conflict between the Monaldeschi and the Filippeschi. This Roca um, in the 15th century, uh, 14th century, was um, terrain fortress of the Monaldeschi family. It is now a museum. It houses the Museo Territoriale de, di Bolsena, the Territorial Museum of Bolsena and area. And you enter into the museum up a little drawbridge right here into uh, the fortress entrance. As you enter, you will be passing Roman artifacts. Uh, these are probably uh, tomb markers and so forth, uh, maybe markers to entrances to temples or whatever. And they lead you right into this extraordinary museum. Uh, I just have to say this, it's a parenthesis. Really, one of the most positive things about all this COVID shutdown and so forth for me, as I've mentioned before, has been discovering the wonders of our area. I had never spent so much time in the museum of the Rocca Monaldeschi as I did uh, a couple weeks ago, researching this, an absolutely extraordinary museum, delightful artifacts. One of the ones which caught my eye and charmed me the most was this Puto, a Cupid, uh, this is probably first century before Christ, Roman, and was perhaps on the facade of a temple either dedicated to Venus or dedicated to Bacchus. And he is reclining or she is reclining on shells and algae. We have a little bit of reflection here because the puto is in a glass case, of course. Another extraordinary treasure 
of this museo inside the fortress of Bolsena is what is called the throne of the panther, il trono della pantera. The throne of the panther may date to as early as the second, third, even century before Christ. In the second century before Christ, it was destroyed at order of the Roman uh, government. The Senate had voted to eliminate the orgiastic rites to Bacchus, to eliminate the orgiastic festivities of the Bacchanalia. And this was hammered into 186 pieces. It has since been pieced together. It was found inside the home of one of the edifices of a Roman settlement just outside the city of Bolsena. The book I read said, fortunately, the Pantera throne had avoided the grasp of the Tombaroli, the tomb robbers because many of the Etruscan and Roman tombs of Bolsena, called Volsini in the Etruscan period, that is 300 BC, were subject to uh, robbery by tomb robbers. Another treasure of the Roman period of this extraordinary museum is the sarcophagus. That is a sarcophagus of the second, third century, which greets you as you enter the museum. It is right over the bookcase with all the guidebooks, guidebooks to the museum, guidebooks to Bolsena and so forth. And it is extraordinary piece. It is in Greek marble. It too is dedicated to Bacchus. The throne of the panther was dedicated to Bacchus. The panther was a symbol uh, used in the rites of Bacchus. This uh, sarcophagus dedicated to Bacchus and in Greek marble. And I want to show you some sections of it. Uh, marvelous carved head of the lion. These are dancing nymphs. And they have a wonderful, wonderful explanations in this museum of all the treasures, including this illustration, which shows you both sides of the sarcophagus and the end of the sarcophagus, the ends of it as well. So isn't that an extraordinary piece here? And you can see heads of Medusa. Uh, this is Pan playing the pipes. Uh, this is Hercules, who's had a little too much to drink. <laughs> so Greek marble treasure of the museum of the territory of uh, Lake Bolsena. And um, I had showed you this photo uh, prior. I had skipped to it, but just want to go back to it. Um, here are some depictions of the nymphs and the lion's head, absolutely extraordinary, including great detail depicted in the carving out of the mane in marble. Here's do two details of the side of, uh, the, of the sarcophagus, the Greek marble sarcophagus. Under the lake, Bolsena, off the bottom, they have found, I would probably say, thousands of treasures. Of the Roman period, the Etruscan period prior, and prior to the Etruscans, the Villanova period. There are many Villanovan treasures in this museum and they date from about 800 to 900 BC. This is an Ola, it was labeled Ola Oleta and I wasn't sure what it was. And I talked to one of the custodians at the museum, a young woman extremely informed. She had worked in this museum about 17 years. And she told me that an Ola was a jar or a container for the holding of foods, the preservation of foods and transportation of foods in the Villanovan period. These pieces here in bronze, 800 BC, are bits of a horse's bridle. This piece that we're seeing right here is a forno, which would be an oven for the cooking of food, extremely elegant as well as the piece next to it in bronze carved out absolutely beautiful exquisite pieces in this museum these are villanovan pieces here this is an ola which is painted in red 
and incised. This is painted as well. It's polished, it's black, beautiful incisions. And this is an oven or a forno for the cooking of food. We call these vases here orcioli, and orcioli were used for uh, the containing of liquids above all. The findings of the Etruscan necropolis are extraordinary. Um, many findings from a necropolis called Capriola of the third century BC. Um, after the period was Villanovan, it was Etruscan, probably Etruscan as of about 6th to 3rd century BC. In 264, uh, Velsna, which was an Etruscan city, perched on the volcanic rock plateau, you now know it as Orvieto, was attacked by the Romans. The survivors fled to the shores of Lake Bolsena, which was then called Volsini, hence the name Volsena, and they established a new colony called Volsini on the shores of Lake Bolsena. In uh, the fifth century AD, the Longobards from the north, from Germany, will attack Bolsena. And at that time, the people leave the lakeshore and head up to the hill. And that fortress, the Roca Monaldeschi, is now on a hill. Medieval Bolsena develops not along the lakeshores, but up on the hill in a more secure position. Two of the exquisite Etruscan treasures are here. Uh, the one on the right, we call an Ascos. And we have met Ascos before in the Wine Museum of Torgiano. Ascos was a small container, uh, generally for the holding of oils or other liquids used for votive offerings. And this little pig, uh, the little porcile, could be filled with a perforation which is under the tummy air area. The beautiful piece on the left is bronze. It was probably the handle of a water basin. It was found in a settlement not far from present-day Bolsena. It's an Etruscan piece, both these pieces, 3rd century BC, and there is an Etruscan inscription here, which is indicating that this is a funerary object, meaning it should not be used for household use, it will be placed in the tomb of the deceased. After you leave the exquisite museo in the fortress, you want to wander down to the central part of town through the beautiful medieval back streets of Bolsena. This is a tower of the fortress. So right here, we're coming out of the door of the fortress. I like to head down this way through this arch and I take a little steep hill down and it will lead me, uh, this is the road I like to take. It leads through another arch and will lead down to the lake area. This is another back alleyway up in the fortress area. And when we get down to the plain, the flat area of Bolsena, we will visit the Basilica of Santa Cristina this is a church built in different phases. Construction goes on between the 11th to the 15th century. It has three or four different sections, including a grotto dedicated to the Saint Christina, we'll talk about her, which is a kind of basiliqueta ipogea, which means an underground little basilica. That'll be on the left side. And then there is a section, 17th century, which is called the Chapel of the Holy Sacrament. And in the main part of the church, there is a Romanesque three-aisled church. And that is certainly medieval building going on maybe between the 12th to 15th century. In the 15th century, uh, renovation of this church and completion of it will be undertaken thanks to a commission by Cardinal Giovanni de' Medici and the populace of Bolsena collaborate together 
for the conclusion and the finishing touches on this very beautiful church dedicated to the patron saint of Bolsena, Santa Cristina, San Giorgio is the other patron saint. We have two co-patron saints. And um, Giovanni de Medici, the cardinal, will become the Medici Pope Leo X. One of the most important parts of the Basilica and perhaps one of the reasons for its construction is related to the saint, Santa Cristina. Interesting story is this Santa Cristina. For the Bolsinese, she is from Bolsena and they have no doubts about it. And she was a saint of the third century AD, martyred after um, her desire to become Christian. This was under the reign of the Emperor Diocletian. It said martyrdom was undertaken. Uh, the first parts of her martyrdom, the first tortures administered by her father, Urbanus, who was a Roman magistrate and so forth. But reading about Santa Cristina and consulting uh, treatises written by archaeologists and historians, there, and my, my daughter-in-law, um, Francesca, who's an art historian in Orvieto, and, you know, is a devout Catholic, uh, very appreciative of Santa Cristina, tells me, no, Anna, she wasn't from Bolsena. Santa Cristina, it's thought, is a saint from the Middle East, either from Lebanon or from Persia. But we'll set that story aside because we're talking about Bolsena. For, so for us today, Santa Cristina was from Bolsena. And she was martyred. Now, in an attempt to end her life because of her conversion to Christianity, she was also thrown into the Lake Bolsena, but she came up floating. And this piece of basalt, volcanic rock, has the imprints of her feet. But even the book I read about the Church of Bolsena says, these, this piece of rock with the imprints is far older than the third century AD. Uh, my daughter-in-law, Francesca, tells me that it was probably an Etruscan votive offering. Uh, thanks for a favor received, Etruscan, 3rd to 6th century BC. It is used as a front piece, the paliotto, if you will, for an altar. Uh, this altar is called l'altare del miracolo, but it's not referring to the miracle of Santa Cristina. It's referring to another miracle. We'll talk about it in a second. It, this is called the altare del miracolo or the altare delle quattro colonne because over this altar is what's called a ciborio, ciborium, and this is made of sculpted columns in uh, pink marble of the eighth to ninth century AD. It is said that the miracle which takes place at this altar is the miracle which we talked about in my talk on Orvieto, and if you haven't heard that talk, I'd suggest you uh, zoom in on it. It's on my website now, because Orvieto is very, very related to Bolsena. Uh, the altar miracle is this. In 1263, a priest from Bohemia called Peter of Prague was on his way to Rome on pilgrimage. He wanted to overcome the tremendous doubts he had about transubstantiation. That is that at the consecration as the host is raised, that the body of Christ is then present in the host. The bread becomes the body of Christ. Well, he was saying mass at Bolsena a stop on his way to Rome. He lifted up the host and the host uh, emanated blood. Blood dripped onto the stone of this altar here and blood dripped onto the Holy Corporal. Word got out quickly to Pope Urban IV who was in Orvieto at the time. This was in 1263. He sends for the Holy Corporal. It is brought to Orvieto where it still remains in the cathedral. And he does verify the miracle of the transformation of uh, the host in the body of Christ. And he will establish a feast honoring this event about a year later. And that feast is called the Feast of Corpus Christi for those of us speaking English or Spanish. For the Italians, it's the Festa di Corpus Domini. Here is the altar of the miracle. It is surrounded in the 16th century by a balustrade. To the left of this is the Grotto of Santa Cristina, which we'll talk about in a minute. But let me show you this. This is the Holy Corporal 
with the blood on it, which is now in uh, the chapel of the Holy Corporal in the Cathedral of Orvieto. So next to the altar of the miracle or the altar of the four columns is a grotto. And this could be the earliest part of the church. Uh, we have a statue here of Santa Cristina, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But under her statue is an ancient tomb. They say it was the original place of her burial. And in this area are the catacombs of the fourth to fifth century AD. We call them Paleo-Christian catacombs, late Christian period. Some are frescoed, some have inscriptions. I was not able to go into them last week. Um, they're open, but you now must book an appointment because of the COVID regulations. So this is the Grotta di Santa Cristina, which is to the left of the altar of the miracle. This is the stone with the blood on it which is kept in a reliquary in the cathedral, of, in the Basilica of Santa Cristina in Bolsena. Now, I want to return here to this um, image of Santa Cristina. This was sculpted uh, in the probably late 15th century by Benedetto uh, uh, Buglioni, who was from Florence. A lot of Florentines worked on this basilica because, of course, as mentioned, the construction of the basilica in the 15th century was sponsored by the Medici's Giovanni dei Medici. Buglioni Benedetto will sculpt this, and he and his father, Francesco, are architects for the facade of the basilica as we know it in the, uh, as we know the 15th century basilica. Uh, over the door are images also done in glazed terracotta by Benedetto Buglioni. Over one door, we have an image of the Virgin and Child with the patron saints of Bolsena, St. George and Santa Cristina. Over another door is Santo Leonardo, St. Leonard. Another section of the church is the one you see as you go through the main entrance, a uh, Romanesque church of uh, the Middle Ages, uh, work will go on 12th, 13th, 14th century. Some of the columns use also some Roman pieces. And there are three uh, naves, one here and two side aisles. There is a chapel to the left, um, which is uh, dedicated to St. Michael the Archangel. And in that chapel, there is an altarpiece, always by Buglioni, and this represents the crucifixion. We can see the Magdalene at the foot of the cross, uh, the Blessed Virgin, St. John the Beloved. And below the cross is the representation of the scene of the miracle of Bolsena, Peter of Prague about to lift the host. This is another piece by the same artist, which is in a side chapel of the church as well. And excuse me, right along the bottom here, we have images of the crucif uh, the excuse me, the martyrdom of Santa Cristina. Uh, various acts were undertaken in the attempt to eliminate her. It takes some time. And right here is the coat of arms of the Medici because this piece too was sponsored by Cardinal Giovanni de Medici who will become Pope uh, Leo X. Now I want to show you two scenes of her martyrdom right here. Here are two scenes. Here's the ordering of her martyrdom. She's being tied. Eventually they do kill her with arrows. They try other little torments as well. Uh, boiling her up in a cauldron, she survives that. This is the beloved image of Santa Cristina, which is carried in procession on her feast day, July 24th. Actually, let me tell you, I just found out recently, this is a copy. And uh, I think the copy was done in 1990 because they no longer wanted to carry through the streets the very precious original one, which I believe was 16th century if not 15th, 15th century, excuse me, by a Sienese artist, and it's now kept in the sacristy. 
and a copy of this, this is the original one, will be carried through the streets. Santa Cristina reigns in uh, her basilica in frescoes, which date from the 14th to the 16th century, various images of Santa Cristina, not just Santa Cristina is remembered, but also San Rocco, Saint Rock. Um, this uh, sculpture on the left, it is painted wood, 18th century. Uh, this is a fresco of him. And in both of these images, he's pointing to a pustule on his leg. These might have been ex voto images, uh, pandemic images, if you will, done at an outbreak of the bubonic plague. San Rocco was invoked. Another saint was invoked. We've talked about it in past lectures. This is San Sebastián. San Sebastiano and San Rocco, both invoked at times of the outbreak of plague. This fresco of San Sebastiano, along with the fresco of San Benedetto of Norcia, St. Benedict, founder of the Benedictines, first monastic order. Were, these were done by Giovanni di Domenico de Ferraris. You don't have to worry about remembering this long name. He's a painter from Piedmont. He frescoed in the late 15th century. At that time, he was living in Bolsena. He also did the image of St. Bernard of Siena, who preached also in Latium, but in Umbria in the mid 15th century, a follower of Francis of Assisi, always held up the Christogram, the symbol for Jesus Christ, the savior of mankind. And this is Bernard of Siena with the Christogram. And this Christogram appears in many of the flower petal tapestries, which are created on the streets of Bolsena to celebrate the feast of Corpus Christi. And of course, it is very strongly felt in the city of Bolsena because after all, that is where the miracle happened, which inspired the feast of Corpus Christi. 60 days after Easter is Corpus Christi. Now, this year, the work on the Infiorate, exquisitely beautiful uh, images, as you can see, was much more limited because of COVID restrictions. Everybody working was masked. These two have their mask down because they're farther than 10 feet away or whatever from the person working with them. Because of the COVID regulations, Bolsena can no longer create through the streets of Bolsena starting the night before over two kilometers of flower petal tapestries. And here's the work going on pre-COVID time on the extraordinary flower petal tapestries created for the Feast of Corpus Christi. Some of you have heard my Spello lecture and know that also Spello too is famous for its celebrations of Corpus Christi as is the town of Canada, not far from Assisi. So these are past in Fiorate, the flowerings. Uh, highly important is always the yellow broom in bloom everywhere at this time of year in June, the use of uh, ferns, ground uh, wild asparagus plants and so forth, ground roses. And so this year, the Infiorate was the celebration of Corpus Christi was limited to uh, three images in front of the Basilica and five over here representing the four uh, districts of Bolsena plus the city of Bolsena. And I started in the morning taking some of my first photos and the children are working with the adults. They're creating uh, the border with a kind of mud paste they've created because everything must remain vegetative. They continue working in the morning. You can see Christ's face is coming along. He's holding up the host. He's holding a chalice. Blood will drip out of this host. I think I show it in one of the images. Uh, this is Signora Raffaella who worked with this group. This is the drawing which she did and which they are going to bring to life. And yes, this is very near, this is actually the completion. And you can see from the host, it has dropped a drip of blood and it is on the Holy Corporal, the Feast of Corpus Domini. Here we see other people working on other images. These young girls were working on the image of the host. Uh, the host bears the symbol IHS. 
this is the one we just saw. This is another symbol also of the host. Um, about mid-afternoon, the altar was ready in front of the Basilica of Santa Cristina in front of the main door because mass would be outdoors with limited seating, mass in the evening. And here you can see this is about six o'clock. The bishop, I believe it was the Bishop of Orvieto said the mass, um, limited seating. Here are the infiorate, which are finished. And these were the ones done by the four different districts of Bolsena. And this one in the middle is the symbol of the city of Bolsena. But let's see a couple of these work in progress. This image was, this was finished, but this is the image of the Rione called the castle, the area around the castle where the museum is. And this young woman is a Castellan, if she will, part, if you will, part of that region. And I asked her if we could have a picture together and she's holding up the victory sign. We've done it, even this year we've done it. These people are working on theirs for the district called San Giovanni which is a certain quarter of the city of Bolsena. Again, look at the IHS depicted. This is one of the city gates. The city gate was actually built by Scalza, who had sculpted that exquisite Pietà in Orvieto that you can't miss if you're in Orvieto. And look at they depicted Lake Bolsena in the background in the city of Bolsena, the IHS, a grain of wheat, and Corpus Domini 2021. Here they are, work in progress. Uh, this is the group that worked on the image of the city of Bolsena. Very proud to be photographed. These people too were delighted to be photographed and they had worked uh, for the district called Il Borgo, the little neighborhood. And I wanna show you some details of this fresco because I want to mention, I'm laughing here. I'm saying, oh, there's the monster. And I'll show you that monster in a minute. But I had talked to Benedetta and I asked her as she worked, could I ask you some questions? She said, certainly. And I said, how is it different this year? And she said, we still have our festa. We still have our passione, but we're missing being able to adorn all of our city with our flower petal tapestries. But she said, in spite of COVID, the passione is not less. And I'm going to show you uh, why I'm laughing because I, I recognize that monstrous face right away. I said, oh, that's the face on the fountain of your district, the Borgo. And she said, precisamente. So here it is, <clears throat> the fountain. This is a fountain, 15th, 16th century. It's in the piazza of the Borgo. There it is right there. This is a detail of it. This is all brickwork in front of the fountain. And that fountain is in the piazza. Here it is called Piazza San Rocco. Now, right across the street, I'm gonna be talking later about the Trattoria da Picchietto, one of our favorite little restaurants in Bolsena. We'll talk about Picchietto, but I wanna also mention, if you ever stay in Bolsena, you might be interested in staying in this noble palace of the 15th, 16th century, where you can rent a room. Look at the bedroom. 90 euro a night, a double, to stay in a Renaissance palace. Palazzo Cozza Caposavi. This is a Flemish tapestry in the reception room of that exquisite palace in the back streets of Bolsena. You know, you walk through these medieval towns and you're looking at these huge palazzi, but folks, look what's inside some of them. Isn't it quite extraordinary? The other Rione which depicted um, an image, the Infiorate, was the Rione of Santa Cristina, the Basilica di Santa Cristina. This is the tapestry done in flowers, the Infiorata with IHS once again. And behind me is a tapestry depicting Santa Cristina. And these are the young people working on the tapestry of uh, Santa Cristina. Children involved as well as adults, of course, all working together. Usually about 20 per, uh, people per group. 
And then late afternoon, the band came through the medieval back streets of Bolsena, trumpets blaring, everybody getting very excited. They're announcing the start of the mass in front of the basilica. So mayors were present in the front row with their sashes on. This is the Santa Cristina again image. So her tapestry is right over here, just to orient you, everybody. And they're from towns around Bolsena, uh, Latium towns. Orvieto's mayor was there as well. And then uh, young children were right behind them. These are the communicants. They're receiving their first communion, uh, all masked. The girls with white wreaths in their hair, there's the young boys all wearing tunics. And those who could not get seats below stood along the railing up above the wall looking down because no one wants to miss the mass of Corpus Domini. You can see how many people are wearing their masks. And these two elderly people were standing as well because uh, they, I want to just show you, I want to enlarge this photo a bit. Yes, um, they wouldn't miss it and they live right near here. They were not able to get seats. Normally they'd be sitting in the Basilica, not this past year, however. Let's hope next year they'll be in seated. Another festa you don't want to miss in Bolsena is an, an extraordinary event. I hope you can be there sometime when the Lavandaye are coming through the streets singing their songs. Uh, they are the singing washerwomen of Tusha. What is Tusha? Tusha is the medieval terminology for the area which was once Etruscan. So Tusha today would include the towns of northern Latium, the towns of, let's say, western Umbria, Orvieto, the towns of southern Tuscany, southwest Tuscany is Tusha. And this group of women are called the La Compagnie de la Lavandaye de la Tusha. Let's go back. The singing washerwomen of Tusha. Simonetta is playing. Uh, her name is Simonetta Chiaretti, and I just want to read you something that she said when I asked her, why did you start this group? She was born in Bolsena. She started this group in 2013. And I said, how did it start? This is a group of 30 multi-generational women who together who sing as they do the wash at the common wash tub, just as their mothers and grandmothers used to do, singing in harmony. And she said her desire was to recuperate the tradition, giving dignity to this work, committed to one's family. For me, the true emancipation of women. The older women would scrub their wash together in the lavandayo, and they would unite in song as they sang. And now and then, and we were there one August night and just lucky enough to know that the washing women of uh, Tusha would be singing that night. And we followed them through the streets. They sang through the streets of Bolsena. They're headed to the common wash area of Bolsena, the lavatoio. As they sang, people at the outdoor tables at the restaurants were enjoying the singing. This was pre-COVID. I think this was 2019. Then they got to the wash area, the lavatoio comunale. The singing continues. We have here Simonetta Chiaretti, uh, who's also soprano, playing her guitar and singing. And as they washed, they threw their wash back and forth. They're singing and throwing their wash, creating a wonderful game out of the event. And here are some older photos of women at the lavatoio, the common wash basin. Here's one of the women of the Compañía de la Lavandaye. A woman of the Compañía de la Lavandaye and past washing women, washing their clothes together at the common wash area. Now, let's see if I can let you hear a bit.
songs are also very melodic. This was just a fun one. Now, one of the most, uh, how can we say, dearly treasured festivals of Bolsena is, of course, the festival honoring the feast of Santa Cristina. Um, her feast is July 24th. Festivities start the night before on, uh, in July, excuse me, on July 23rd, when the statue of Santa Cristina is carried from the Basilica of Santa Cristina to a church called the Church of the Holy Sacrament. Uh, we have evidence of celebrations to Santa Cristina many, many centuries ago. And the present festival, as we know it today, called the Misteri, which are tableaus presented of various episodes of her tortures, dates from the 19th century. But in the Middle Ages, there was already a feast for Santa Cristina as of the 12th century. And I believe it was by the 13th or 14th century, there were even events around her feast day dedicated to her in which many people participated. I think by the 15th century, there were horse races. There were contests among the fishermen and fishing in the lake. All kinds of events celebrating the saint, as well as the fiera, the special street market. Remember that the word for an outdoor market is mercato, but if it celebrates a saint, it's called a fiera. So the festivities have been going on for many, many years, uh, certainly since the 12th century when her feast was declared. In the 13th century, a pope declared an indulgence, full indulgence to anybody who went to her tomb on her feast day, July 24th. And by the 15th century, there were um, processions through the street carrying huge candles to her grave. Now what we're seeing is a festival which originated in the 19th century, the Misteri di Santa Cristina, mysteries, if you will, the acting out of um, episodes of her martyrdom. When we arrived in Bolsena a couple of years ago on July 24th, women were sitting up at the castle. So they're waiting for the um, uh, Santa Cristina to be carried out of the chapel across the street. They're sitting right at the edge of the entrance to the fortress, the castello. So we're up at the castello. Across the street, mass is going on in the Church of the Holy Sacrament. The statue has been carried to that church and has stayed in that church all night. And now it is July 24th and she will be carried back to the Basilica of Santa Cristina, following the route of the acting out of different episodes of her martyrdom. When I was waiting for the mass to end and people to come out, I saw this middle-aged man in a blue shirt with Santa Cristina on the um, pocket. And I said, excuse me, what, what do you do? And he said, I'm part of the Compagnia of Santa Cristina. This is Stefano, uh, Stefano Brizzi. He's really become a friend now. We've been in contact a lot, especially for my talk on uh, Bolsena. And he, for many years, has been one of the people who carries her statue. And He's part of a group. And I said, could I take your picture? And he said, you could take my picture, but only if you also get a picture of all of us, my group with you. So here we are. Here's the group of the portatori, the carriers of Santa Cristina. Here's Pino and here I am as well. And this is go the uh, representation of her martyrdom, one of the misteri, which will be presented before they carry out the statue of the church. So here we are at the outer wall of the castle. This represents the drawing on the wheel. They tried to draw and quarter her. It didn't work. These are tableau. Everybody is frozen. There's very little movement. There's simply scenes that are presented with great passion. See, they're just to the right of the wheel. These are elegant Roman women below one of the towers of the castle, observing what will happen to Santa Cristina. After that presentation of that tableau or that mistero, 
Santa Cristina exited the church, carried on the shoulders of the portatori. One of the portatori is Stefano right there. I was happy to see that one of the portatori is also a woman. And Santa Cristina is carried down from the church of the Holy Sacrament. Following here, this is the Bishop of Orvieto. He's holding a precious relic of Santa Cristina. And they're going through the town back to the Basilica of Santa Chiara, people following them. You can see the lake below. And they'll be passing a scene of another one of the Misteri. This is one that's kind of a favorite for everybody. It's called the Serpari because real snakes are used. In the story, there was a Serparo. These are scenes from different years. And thanks to Stefano Casole, who I've met too, and, and let me use his photos, absolutely wonderful photos, two different years of the same scene. Um, this is a kind of evil wizard who uh, presents to Christina poisonous snakes. And the snakes do not bite her. They turn around and bite him. He collapses, <laughs> but he does not die because she prays for him. And the Bolsonese really like this because they are real snakes used. Now, what I think is absolutely wonderful about Santa Cristina is look at these bodies, everybody. I think the gyms in the area of Bolsena are probably packed in May and June with everybody getting ready for their scenes of presentation of the martyrdom of Santa Cristina, July 24th. This is the scene, she's praying, he's died, and this was the Serparo, the snake charmer, the snake wizard, evil. And he was an evil man, but when I asked for a photo, he beamed with a nice gentle smile, the Serparo. From the Serparo, we walk down the street, we're right near that palazzo, the noble palace, right behind us is the fountain, which I showed you before, we're at Piazza San Rocco. These women are about to freeze in their image of holding grapes. They're elegant Roman women. These people are already posed. They're totally um, immobile for this scene of one of the tortures of Santa Cristina and it was the cutting out of her tongue. This is the fellow who did it and he's holding her tongue. This is the, one of the young girls who plays Santa Cristina. It's everybody's dream, if you're a young woman, of Bolsena to some year represents Santa Cristina. There's a different Santa Cristina person for every one of the different misteri. And after they presented their scene, they all gathered for a selfie. And here we are in front of the noble palace Right on the fountain we are, the area of Piazza San Rocco. This is the noble palace where you may wish to stay if you ever stay overnight in Bolsena. Now, one of the people participating in this scene is always young Matteo. There he is. And because his family owns the Picchietto restaurant across the street, the Totria da Picchietto. And there he is the same day, clothes changed, showing us uh, the the parchment he has that he received for his participation in the mistero of the cutting of the tongue. At the end of the day, we uh, had gone there for, I believe, dinner. Pino's enjoying some mussels, but then he will have the lake fish, the Corregone, uh, which is a white fish caught in the lake. And I always have pasta with corregone, the lake fish, tomato, and pine nuts, and saffrons, and it's absolutely out of this world. Pino will opt for the corregone grigliata, the lake white fish on the grill. And when we were there at dinner that night, we were delighted to see Fabio and his son Francesco. Fabio is a devil of a guy, as you're going to see in just a moment, and Francesco is an angel of a little boy, as you're going to see in just a moment. After the cutting of the tongue, you pass into the main square of Bolsena, where the presentation will be 
of the death scene of Santa Cristina. After many different tortures, they finally are able to kill her. Uh, this is called the scene of the Freche, the scene of the arrows. And she dies pierced with arrows. And then in front of the Basilica of Santa Chiara is the Glorificazione di Santa Cristina, the glorification of Santa Cristina, who will ascend into heaven, accompanied by angels. And this is the final scene. This is Fabio the devil. And this is Francesco, the little angel, who has kicked the devil right into hell. <laughs> Sons one up and ship on father. This is Fabio, this is Francesco in the final scene. The glorificazione di Santa Cristina. Everybody absolutely immobile. And they posed for a group photo afterwards. There's Francesco, little Francesco, his father, Fabio. These are two of the main organizers of the scene. At the end of the presentation of the Misteri, so there would have been five on July 24th. We did not see the ones the night before. Five on the evening of July 23rd. So if you go to Bolsena and wish to see the event of the Misteri, ideally is stay overnight July 23rd and see July 24th. At the end of the Misteri, there is a mass in the Basilica of Santa Cristina. And the statue is, has then returned home and people pass to touch the statue, welcoming her home. You can see this woman here is touching the statue. This is the young woman who played Santa Cristina in the glorification scene. And before she goes home and changes, she has come in to say, you know, her prayer to Santa Cristina. And right next door, at the coffee bar are a lot of the participants. Some have changed their clothes, not all have changed their clothes. This is Fabio, who was the devil. This is the young girl, Clelia, I think her name was, who played Santa Cristina. She's changed out of her clothes. These two guys are just, you know, in natural state from the scene. Uh, it looks like they're sharing Campari and soda with a feta da rancho, slice of orange. And I asked if they could take their picture and they all said, sure, but you have to be in it. So I said, why not? There they all are. And now I went back this year for the uh, Corpus Christi, saw a lot of them. They just, some of the face I didn't even recognize. And they said, um, the Misteri, I was in the Misteri. And there is uh, Fabio the Devil right behind me. Next Sunday, we hope to be in uh, Bolsena as well for the extraordinary Festa delle Hortensie. It will go on for three days, the hydrangeas. Bolsena is absolutely famous for its exquisite hydrangeas. This is the Viale del Lago, the road to the lake. It is all lined by exquisite hydrangeas of every imaginable variety and color. You can see here the hydrangea along the lakefront. So next weekend is another exquisite moment in daily life in the lakeside town of Bolsena. Very close to Orvieto, just about 20 minutes away. It's in the region of Latium, an absolute gem and not to be missed. May we make, meet there someday at the Lago di Bolsena. Thank you for being with us. I thank you all for your presence, for the support you're giving me as I continue on my endeavors of presenting Italy virtually. I will continue a bit more until guide work picks up in September. So this is my work for now and many thanks for supporting it. Thanks to those of you who made donations and those of you who will make donations.